Greetings. Welcome to In Depth. I'm DK Rosta. We are looking at Labor Day from the perspective of human resources and organizational development. And for that, we are doing so with Dr. Hyacinth Guy, who has 35 years experience in related fields. Hello, Dr. Guy. How are you doing? Good afternoon, Mr. Rustin. How are you? I'm all right, thank you. But I want to start off asking about the role of human resource management and kind of bridging that divide that you can sometimes find between employer and employees. Right. Um, we could look at it, um, DK, from the perspective of what is the HR set up to do in organizations. Huh? And I mean, you know, you look at an HR department and it it has the responsibility to take the goals, the wide organizational goals, and translate that down to the lowest level in the organization, operationalize it, right? Uh, you know, through a performance management system and so on. But in doing so, it has to set up systems that allow for effective and meaningful relationships among the, the various stakeholders in the organization. And in particular, between employees and their managers and supervisors, and between uh, uh, managers and supervisors, and if there is any third party representing the employees, uh, for example, trade unions or associations and so on. So HR has to ensure that yes, you have the people, the people have the talent, uh, um, you know, you, you manage a good compensation and benefits and other, other programs, but you have to ensure that the environment is conducive to that relationship. And it means setting up systems in organizations which facilitate that. Number one, a good dispute resolution system, meaning you give employees a voice. And you give employees a voice in the organization. If you have a grievance a procedure, um, proper disciplinary procedures, which say to, to employees, what are the performance expectations and uh, what uh, would be the consequences of not following or not achieving those performance expectations. And really most important, I believe DK, um, training managers and supervisors on how to interact effectively and build meaningful relationships in the workplace. And you see that little uh, unit that I am managing, I should be trained to do that so effectively that there is nothing in there that spawns a conflict. So it means that I, I train my managers and supervisors to engage employees, to interact with them, and when necessary, interact with the trade union who act on behalf of the, of the employee. So it means you have to set up effective dispute resolution systems in the organization. And that, when you know you have that, it's when you ask yourself, what's the culture of this organization in so far as um, you know, resolving issues or the relationships. What is it like? And somebody could give you a word which say, you know, we have a good relationship here. You know, things, things are okay here. Yes, we have our issues, but things are okay. When they say, hmm, that place? No, 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 no. That place toxic, no. Well, that, that is one of the things I wanted to ask about. And, and, and we'll go to the training of employees, persons who mm -hmm. are possibly mm -hmm. middle management positions who have their units mm -hmm. under them. But how do you treat, you use the word culture, how do you treat with a culture that potentially sees human resources as just, you, you, you are one of the, you, you, you're, the, you're, the bigger, you're the bigger field hand with, with that whip or yeah. you are, you're just put in place. To, as the, as to, the police, you know, the compliance you know, kind of thing. You're, you're yes. snitching or you're yes. telling or you're just uh, yes. enacting. So communication and directives are only going one way and I mean, it doesn't seem as though um, conversation yeah. is really happening. You also spoke about having a voice. When you don't feel you have a voice, what kind of recourse is there? What, how, how can HR kind of change that culture? Are you talking from the perspective of the employee or are you talking about HR itself being viewed as not having a voice? Who are you speaking about? Let's talk about the employee first, especially since right. we, we, we write around Labor Day. Right, yes, yes. So there are some workplaces like that. There are workplaces with that kind of a culture. And, you know, if you are in the HR profession, you have to know what uh, environment am I working in. Eh? 
And am I in an environment that uh, is uh, engaging, that uh, it facilitates performance, that uh, uh, creates uh, you know mutually beneficial relationship, or am I in an environment that is you know uh, you know as I say toxic and where people you know when they get up in the morning they say oh I have to go to that place again no so so it it really comes down to what is HR's role in that and that was the first question that you asked what is HR's role in that and it starts with HR assessing what is the state of that culture and 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 I've seen organizations do that already they do uh, uh, an engagement survey a culture survey a satisfaction survey and you get your information we we have to get more data driven in our organizations the game we have to to you and use that data to be able to make decisions and I think uh, we are a little bit far from that we're not there as we should be but Dr. Guy, I team might team. be a little I might be a little nervous to give some information that yes one person is objective okay there may be someone that you got externally to get the information mm -hmm. but when I describe that situation the person mm -hmm. knows it can only be me no 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 not, not depending on how you design that survey and I've seen surveys designed and you get a good professional to design a survey no and you, and you see, this is where trust comes in. HR has to establish itself in the organization that it is trusted, right? And if it is not there, it has to gradually build that over time. So I'll go back to the getting information, knowing where we are. So, okay, I was, I've worked at an organization whose satisfaction engagement survey is 12%. You know what that means? 12% of the organization is satisfied with what the organization is doing in about eight or nine factors, leadership, supervision, workflow. 12% of the organization is satisfied. Now people act on what they believe. If I don't, if I believe that you are not uh, doing things in a way that you know, I am comfortable with, I am, um, that seeks my interest, then yes, I will show up, I will show up and I'll do just what I have to do and perhaps no more. Today, we need employees to be engaged in the workforce and to go that extra mile. You know, sometimes we want them to go without us even driving them there. That's when we know that people are engaged. So data helps you. And when you break down the information in that survey, then you see where the pockets of dissent are. And then you develop some you know programs to intervene and to deal with some of the issues and you set give your managers and supervisors and right up to the ceo targets which will say this has to change you see this engagement survey score that we have is just 12 percent by next year we want to see it as say 20 percent and to make that go from 12 to 20 percent would require managers supervisors, executives, even the CEO, HR, to do things differently. And in terms of doing those things differently, I want us to, I don't want, I don't want to just have you distill and try to get that in these far, in these few seconds before we take mm -hmm. a break. So let's take the break and then we come back to what some of those things can be, as well as essential factors for good performance management. So stay with us. We're speaking with Dr. Hyacinth okay. Guy. We return with more. Welcome back. We are going in depth on uh, many things with Dr. Hyacinth Guy. And one of the things we were talking about just before we took that break were factors for essentials, essential factors for good performance management. Because you spoke about culture, you spoke about systems, you spoke about building capacity. So how do we kind of take all those things and break them down into incremental factors that are achievable and we can work towards to, to uh, uh, achieve? again, come right back to the role of HR in the organization. And HR has to partner with managers. HR can do these things on its own. And HR must also be a partner with the CEO and executive management in the organization. So let's say we have this information, we have this survey, and we can break down this survey and we can say, what department are you in in your organization, um, DK? What's the name of your department? News and Current Affairs. 
news and current affairs. Let's say you are the head of news and current affairs and you have five employees <laughs> reporting to you. And a survey was done. Three employees took part in the survey. You don't know which three employees took part in the survey, right? But your engagement score turned out to be 20%. Yes? I now could distill your information from that report and say in DK's department where this engagement score turned out to be 20%, DK's issues are it doesn't communicate effectively. There is a low level of engagement. Uh, DK makes decisions on his own because those are questions that would be asked under different headings in the survey. And now I could say to you, DK, for this is 2022, we have done this survey and the results were reported mid-year. I'm going to do another survey at the end of this year, and then I'm going to do another survey in 2023. And I can say to you, DK, I want this score to be increased by this percentage. In order for you to do that, you have to communicate better. Communication means X, Y, and Z. I'll put you through training programs to help you with that. I want you to manage performance better. I want you to set goals and be clear on those goals because employees are saying that, uh, you know, frequently, you know, I, uh, goals are changed and, and I'm not clear on how policies are interpreted. That speaks to how you manage. So I bring it right down to you you as an individual manager. And I put that into your performance goals. You have to achieve those things. Together with all of these new things that you do, there are some behavioral things that you have to demonstrate. And I want to see a change in that. And that now causes you to say, hmm, how am I going to show up to these employees? I thought all the time I had a good management style. But no, they say, no, it's not good. And I can see it in the results because they, you know, they, they, there's value being left on the table. There could be so much more coming out of this of this of this department. So I charge you with that responsibility, and I manage your performance over time, and I look to see the incremental improvements over time. This is very data driven. But the fact that you're using that sort of data it makes mm -hmm. me want to ask the question: How do you treat with that if you have people who are performing doing doing that level of insanity in terms of expecting something different? but doing the same thing over and over and over. How, speak to that person uh, to, to let them know that new modules may be needed for, as, for assessment towards increasing capacity and that sort of training that you're talking about. Yeah. You see, coming out of COVID, um, DK, I think it, it brought into focus things we always knew. And things we always knew we had to change. But then uh, this landed on our doorstep and we some of us quickly, quickly pivoted. And we said, no, you know, we, in order for this organization to continue to run, to be, um, you know, to thrive a bit, you know, during COVID, we have to do things differently. So, you know, it, it really speaks to each, each employee, and let's speak to managers and supervisors, each managers and supervisors becoming aware of what he or she is contributing. Eh? A lot of us measure ourselves by, uh, that content, that news content that I put out there, or, you know, the sales that I did, but then, okay, the sales brought in some revenue. And then, uh, you know, when you look down the road, you see that your expenses and, um, you know, absences, injuries, and a whole lot of other, other things would have gone up, whittling away what should have been a better, you know, net profits kind of situation. So we now have to cause our managers and supervisors in this new environment to say, look, you see the way we operated, which spoke to, um, if I could see people, I could uh, manage them, I could supervise them, we probably have to shift that a little bit and emphasize more outcomes over efforts. Right now, you know, kind of comfortable if we, if you could say, you know, this person worked hard or, but what is the outcome? What is the result? And if we could shift our thinking to from um, managing for outcomes rather than efforts, I think that we would have taken our managers and supervisors to another level. They're not there yet. They're not there yet. And a lot of them are saying, you know, you know, yes, we had this pandemic, things have changed, but um, we, we want employees back into the office. Now, for the most part, if you want the employees back into the office, okay. But again, I come back to data. Are we doing the studies to show what is the best model for us? Is it 
uh, something that, that is, you know, a, a mixed system, a full in the office system, or a remote system. And we need to do that. And when we do that and we identify what is best for us, what has worked for us and what can work for us, then we give our managers the skills and competencies in order to manage differently and manage for those outcomes. But what because, might be best might not be the easiest and sometimes it's the easiest level that we go to because it's, it's a little familiar and mm -hmm. okay, well, this is what we know and it has kind of been working because when you talk about outcome versus effort, Dr. Guy, mm -hmm. I think sometimes there, there are other caveats or other nuances because someone might be very punctual from eight to four or nine to five but they're not really functioning, but they're there. And but what so, are we measuring? So what are those kind of metrics? In what are terms we measuring? Of like get that, to we, get that best thing going forward. When we measure outcomes, again, I'm coming back to your situation, to your, to your job. You're measuring outcomes. What is an outcome for you? Your organization may say, I want to in, increase my market share by 10%. That's a big global strategy, a global objective. Uh, uh, organizational objective. I want to increase my market share by 10%. That's your role in that. How do you, how does that cascade down to you? You have to do effective interviews. You have to do interviews that probably have a particular reach. I don't know if you measure hits and uh, penetration and all those things that leads up into there. So we have to set our performance management systems so that we measure those things. We establish those KPIs for you that are linked to the organization outcomes. And we also measure, which is something we have not been doing, Diki, and not been doing it to, to the extent that we should have been doing it. We also measure what competencies do you demonstrate in the, in the workplace? Because if you come here and the, the first thing you, said, you say to me has me a little bit perturbed, then I say, mm, I don't like his attitude then you know uh, there's a competency perhaps collaboration that you're not um, demonstrating you know and we have to identify the competencies that make you successful in that job and a lot of times we hire because the person is a good salesperson they're bringing a lot of revenue we don't know how much of that is whittled away because of uh, inappropriate behaviors and so on uh, but we now have to merge those two the the thing the what you have to do together with the how you have to do it. And there are ways we can design systems and organizations to measure those things. I feel like you're throwing stone in my garden a little bit. Tonight, <laughs> you know, it's all right. I, 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 thought the, I thought, you know, the references should be, should take on some meaning, you know? <laughs> too much meaning, too much meaning. <laughs> all right, but I'll, in, I'll but, in the last, but in the last minute we have, though, let me ask any mm -hmm. closing words on, just kind of wrap a little bow around this conversation. Thank you. Yeah. Um. I'm a little concerned as I have been um, working with, you know, a lot of clients and uh, I find that lately there are lots of people, individuals that come to me and they ask for advice. I mostly work with organizations as clients, but I'm having individuals coming to me expressing concern about their working situation, the employment contracts post COVID. Now, during COVID, there were a lot of changes and, and uh, we have we found that there were a lot of unilateral changes. Organizations had to pivot, they had to survive. So they made changes. They may have you know, spoken to employees, we have to do this, we have to do that, but the contracts were changed, yes? So and for the most part, employees say, okay, if that's what it is, you know, I'll weather it. Now we are kind of out of it. And a lot of employees are saying, but, I'm back to working five days in the office. I am back to doing the, you know, all of the things that I had to do. You, ca can you bring back my salary to the 100%? You cut it to 75, bring it back to the 100%. You know, um, you cut my vacation leave. You introduce a new policy, which say, you know, I have to, um, I, and I didn't have this before. And suddenly, you know, you have introduced a retirement age in the organization and I have to retire next year. I and didn't know it. And we, and we have to retire the conversation right now. Oh, but the thing is, <laughs> you, see, you see all these things that you're raising at the end of the conversation, but we want to thank you very much, Dr. Yeah, Hyacinth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And on behalf of the entire TTT News team, this has been In Depth with me, DK Rasta. Thank you so much for joining us.